Welcome to Why I'll Never Make It, a lighthearted podcast that takes a revealing look at a career in the entertainment industry, featuring stories and conversations with those on stage and backstage, on screen and behind the scenes. To keep up with all the guests and episodes, go to the website, winmepodcast.com. There you will find ways to follow and connect via Twitter and Instagram, as well as ways to support and donate to this podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Oliver Jones, and this is Why I'll Never Make It. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Why I'll Never Make It. Now, as you would rightly guess, most of my listeners are here in America, of course. However, I also have listeners from all over the world, including Canada, Spain, Malaysia, and Australia, just to name a few. With most of the focus on who will win and won't win the Tony Awards right now, I wanted to look at the bigger picture and see what theater, what creative energies are happening outside of New York City. Well, in fact, outside the U.S. So this will be my very first international episode. Joining me on the program today is Cheryl Lee Seckham from Australia. With over 35 years on stage creating roles in musical theater, farce, and dramatic works, she began working as a freelance theater director, creating large-scale musical theater productions in her hometown of Brisbane, Australia. Uh, now, in 2011, she was appointed as the communications and online marketing manager to Savoy Yards Musical Comedy Society, which is a, a large community-based theater company, and began the process of creating their online presence. Well, in 2014, an experience with a passionate but under-resourced regional theater company, it inspired her to begin a blog called An Idiot on Stage. And she does this to, to highlight ways in which community-based theater organizations can both improve and also grow. And she is joining me to talk about her journey as both an actress and as a director here on the program. Cher, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. It's great to be here, Patrick. I'm so glad to be your first international guest. <laughs> yes, yes. So you are you are how many hours ahead of me right now? Because because right now it is it's six p.m. here, and it's and it's eight a.m. eight a.m. same day. So, yeah. So fourteen fourteen hours ahead of me. Somewhere around there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're like I wasn't aware there was going to be math on the program. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. But uh, well, well, thank you for for being up early this morning and joining me on the podcast. My pleasure. So I, I I wanted to start right off, and I mean, with a name like an idiot on stage, like where did that come from? Why 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 do you have that title? When I started the blog, I thought, oh, this is going to be some serious work. I'm going to you know share my experiences and and uh, help people out. So I happened to be listening to a boy, uh, the boy from Oz, and I love Judy Garland's song um, Quiet Please. There's a lady on the stage. And I thought, oh, lady on the stage, that's brilliant. And I thought, no, really, too much of an idiot for that. That's just not going to cut it. It's, I've got too many experiences where, you know, you sort of start to develop too much pride in yourself and you instantly fall flat on your face. An idiot on stage is far better. So that really just, it, it was just for me more than anything, but it just resonated with so many people because I was able to share and remind people of the joy of what we do and just not taking yourself seriously, but what you do seriously. So that's really where it came from. I, th I think that's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, I get a little bit of flack for my own title of the podcast. So, so it's, it's nice to meet a kindred spirit who realizes <laughs> that, that this creative venture that we're on isn't all just glitz and, and spotlight, you know, that there's, no. there's a lot of downtimes and setbacks to go along with it. That's right. That's right. And you can't take them too seriously. You can't let them get you down. You've got to develop a way of approaching them from the beginning. Well, I think that's so important because I think for most of us, we started as young children, maybe, or, you know, adolescents getting into theater and it was something fun. It was an activity that our friends were doing or something that, oh, wow, I get to like be on stage or I can sing this song or whatever it was. And it starts as this fun, energetic experience. And I think so often we get mired in the business side of it once we grow up that we lose sight of that childlike fun of it. 
We do. And if you're going to make this a career, yes, it's hard work. I think that element is lost on, on people. There's, there's, I find there's two groups of people that tend to go into this industry, those who are seeking fame for the wrong reasons and those who understand that it's a job and a craft. The job and the craft people tend to last longer and uh, sustain better. Whereas, you know, if you don't figure out pretty quickly that the fame issue isn't going to you know, work for you and what is actually driving that, then you're going to crash and burn sometime soon. So, you know, being able to maintain the fact that you are a creative person, not just that your creativity, that goal that you're heading for is the only thing that's going to make you happy, I think sort of being able to sustain that is, is very important and each individual person has to find their way of maintaining that joy. And with your experience, both with the blog, but also your years of working in the business beforehand, what have you found are ways that people are using to sustain themselves and, and keep that, that energy and keep that drive going? Well, that's an interesting question because here in Australia, one of the statistics show that people in the creative industries have high levels of mental health issues, you know, depression and anxiety. And we actually have an organisation um, here in Australia that started a few years ago to support that. I think one of the, the things that is so important for creatives is to have a tribe, is to have that group of people that supports you in the, throughout your process because it's tough when 90% of the time it's rejection. And a lot of artists go into this, a lot of creatives, uh, emerging artists, from the very beginning, they go into this with all the good intentions. They do their studies, they do their skill, but they haven't developed a foundation that says, this is the way I'm going to react when I get rejection. This is the way I'm going to react and deal with people who are, you know, just stupid. And <laughs> it's... Because there's plenty of those. There's plenty of stupid out there. That's right. But... They don't have these foundations. And so when, and it's always when, not if, when they strike these situations constantly in their career, they don't know how to react. And so we get depression, we get anxiety, we get crash and burn. And there's so much loss of great creative talent because the underlying foundation of who they are as a person, that strength, that self-awareness isn't there. I think that's so that's so important because I mean certainly here in America I I have many friends myself included who has gone to therapy just not just for career stuff but just kind of keeping our our mental and emotional awareness uh, front and present so that we can always be as as you said so that we can be ready for what comes our way because there's plenty of downturn there's plenty of unemployment there's plenty of as you said people that we work with that aren't the best people to work with and and sometimes i will admit sometimes i'm that person i i know that in in my career i've been the person that's like why why are you acting like this why why are you saying these things and so i've been that stupid person as well and as you mentioned that uh, there in Australia that they started this program, was that something that began at like a local level? Was it more of a governmental level or how, how did this program kind of come about? Well, it's a national pr uh, program that was started by artists themselves, the industry themselves. So uh, it's, they have a, an annual event and it's, it's just providing the support, but it's, it's very different. It's still the same thing is, is do people access it? Do people seek help? Do people understand that it's not, uh, it's no reflection on them at those times when they do need that support? Because, you know, in our society today and in, in, in creatives, we're reflective of that. We, we don't live in tribes. We don't live in that collective that says right now today I need the support I've just had this rejection from you know from the audition or the audition didn't go well or whatever it is and I'm struggling to deal with this mm. sit with me in this let me you know purge on you for a while and then give me a boot up the behind when I've had enough and I'm you know living in it for too long and I'll move on we try to do it on our own and we're not built that way and the other side of this is as actors we are students of human nature so to be self, become self-aware, to be constantly being um, developing our self-awareness and studying human nature as it is, that makes us better actors. And if we isolate ourselves and we remain in the bubble of auditions and um, perhaps touring or doing whatever it is, and we're not out in the real world studying human nature, I think we're suffering as actors. 
I absolutely agree. Yeah, a few weeks ago, I did uh, a couple of episodes dealing with auditions, you know, and the rejection that comes with that. Sometimes, so, yeah. the, sometimes the, the the funny things that happen, but also like the the down moments that come from that. And so, I I think it's so important that uh, that as you say that we have that community, that tribe of people that that understand us. We can kind of commiserate with, get that kick in the seat, and get back out there again. That's right. So you mostly work with actual theaters or do you also work with actors individually or both? With both. Um, I work on a community level. So I'm a big fan of what theatre does in local communities. Um, Blending professional actors with um, people who haven't had their professional debut or have no intention of doing that and getting them working together, that sort of thing. So um, theatre is just it's undervalued in our society as to what it does for people, whether it be for confidence, whether it, what it does for kids and teenagers, adults, the whole thing. Uh, and viewing it not just as a career, but as part of life. I think, I think people miss out when they don't realize how much it can offer them. I think that's so true. I know here in America, it, it's it has pockets of support, but there's certainly a lot of communities where they've decreased arts funding, you know, in favor of this or that. And and not that there's anything wrong with math and, and English or, or, you know, those type of core curriculum uh, subjects. But I think whether it's sports, whether it's arts, these outside activities that give us physical and mental and creative outlets are so important. And there in Australia, what is the general vibe when it comes to pursuing a career in the arts? <laughs> it's tough. It's <laughs> tough. It's a very different world down here than, say, New York, where in New York you might do four or five auditions in a day. Here in Australia, let alone in Brisbane, which is about halfway up the East Coast, um, it's, you'd be lucky to get that in a month just mm. because the work is not available for it. It's not greatly funded. We're always fighting for, for funding. It's, it's the same anywhere, I guess. But, you know, losing a lot of performers feel that they must move from, say, Brisbane to what is considered the, the theatre uh, hubs, if you will, will, of Melbourne and Sydney, which, you know, people in the US have probably heard of more. Um, but we it's say in Brisbane, we have a, a major, you know, performing arts complex here in, in the city, but we get one touring show, you know, at a time. We don't have all the theatres that are in New York. So you find that actors here in Brisbane have to create their own work. And so you get a lot, this huge community of, of, of cabaret work, small independent theatres uh, doing, you know, profit share, which is another word for not getting paid, you know. It's um, developing, it, writing original works, which is really, really great in the cre- creativity side. But the business model of being able to say, sustain yourself as a performer is almost impossible. It's very, very difficult. Funding is limited. It goes to particular organisations, mainly educational uh, and our state theatre. But there's a lot of underground activity, uh, which is really great to see. But it's that's where I find myself in supporting those emerging and that underground activity in providing resources, whether it be my studio and, and um, connecting people with, um, you know, directors and all that sort of thing trying to help them sustain themselves in their career, providing what I can. So I really enjoy that. I love that, that element. And so with yourself, you had decades of work before you, you got to this point where you are. How did you sustain yourself through those decades of work as both an actress and a, and a director? Well, I married, I married uh, my husband who was doing eight shows a week as a pit musician. So um, I quickly learned that eight shows a week was not, I think you're made for that. Um, I was not myself a big fan of the eight shows a week gig. Um, And I'm a musical theatre performer mainly. Um, And so I, I love the rehearsal auditions through to rehearsal as a director, that whole development of a creative piece. I love it. But as an actor, once I got to opening night, I'm done. I'm out. (laughs) I've been here, done this piece. I don't want to do it anymore. So it wasn't really something that um, 
I was I cared about pursuing in a great a great way. So what came along came along and I was happy with that. And having one person in the house doing that eight shows a week with the lifestyle, trying to sustain, we've always lived the creative life financially. Um, it's tough. It's tough. And then when you add three kids into the to the mix, you you make some choices as to how you're going to earn that living. So for me it's it's come along with um you know the 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 studio and uh, the marketing and doing everything for actors for these small theatre companies, but not necessarily always being on the stage myself. And I have found that as I've got older, facilitating others, watching them achieve what they want to do, there's no bigger buzz. There really isn't. That's I think it's the mother in me that comes out. No, just sort of watching them hit their opening night, a new actor hit their opening night and then afterwards with their family and their friends and everyone's so proud of them and can just see the change in a person. It's just, it's magnificent. It's just wonderful. Do you have a story or two that stick out to you of those kind of motherly times where someone had that transformation when it comes to being on stage? I think so. I think so. I had uh, the one that sticks out for me, the, the, my favourite, is doing a, a production of nice work if you can get it in Brisbane and I had a young actress um, who auditioned for um, the role of Jeannie and she was always considered she'd always considered herself a dancer and so that was that was she was always in chorus in ensemble and uh, Desney and and um, Jeff and I looked at her audition she turned up and she just blew us away with this audition that was unexpected we'd seen her work before and it was unexpected and we'd all looked at each other and thought you know, she really wants this. There's potential there. Let's bring in uh, an acting coach to work with her and give her this shot. Let's let's work with her. Otherwise, you know, we all know what that's like. You sort of you, you want to do the work, but you've got to. It's a catch twenty two. So anyway, we started this this with this work with her in her very first rehearsal. She freaked, and she just said, "I am so nervous. I don't know what to do. I physically feel ill." So Vanessa came in and worked with her over the next few months and she was going along really, really well. It was fine, but it wasn't until we bumped into the theatre for two weeks of tech and first rehearsal where she ran through her number and it was like the character just arose. It just it popped in there. And I stood at the bottom of the stage and I said, there's Jeannie. And the look on her face was just so alive. She suddenly had this confidence in herself. And she stepped onto the stage, got great reviews for the season, and she was just another person. And I was just, we were all just so delighted that that uh, we had been witness to her transition from someone who, you know, walks into an audition space saying, I don't know if I can do this, you know, sort of, but I'm going to do this, try this anyway, to someone who commands a stage and just blew it away. It was just wonderful. I love it. What was that moment or that element that kind of gave her uh, that step from uh, I'm nervous, I can't do this, I'm physically ill to to being that superstar that she became? I think maybe it's the same for all of us. I think it's a combination of we have to make choices. It's there's no I don't think there's a magic moment that it happens to you. I think you do have to make the choice to go, okay, it's this or nothing, I'm going to do it. But then it's also providing resources for performers in that, you know, with Vanessa as, a, as an acting coach coming in and giving her techniques she didn't have. This is an intelligent woman, an intelligent actress. So it was obviously there all the time, but she had not got given herself the resources or the, the right um, conversation to herself in her head that said, hey, I can do this you know, step out and, and, and just give it, she's a dancer, dancers work hard. So there's a whole work ethic in a dancer that you sometimes don't get in, in actors. Um, they I, know, I absolutely you know what agree. it is. You yes. get it? Yeah. So I think that stood her in good stead in that, well, I'm just going to get out there and I've, I've got, I've done everything I can. She was supportive. Vanessa is just beautiful with actors and um, giving her the resources and then, it's all up to her. It really is her choice. And she was the one that made it happen. I think. And you, you mentioned resources, which I think is so essential to all of us. And, and that's not just uh, acting support and having that community and tribe that we talked about, but also having the financial resources. And, and I imagine that with the theaters that you work with, that's one of the, the major concerns in keeping the funding and just 
keeping the doors open. It is. It is. For small independents here in Brisbane, um, very few of them have funding. Uh, it, it doesn't matter anywhere in Australia. Um, the small independent theatre companies that are professional theatre companies that are trying to support a small ensemble. Um, and there's a huge number of them. It's an enormous number of them. But they don't get funding. They can access a grant if they're lucky, but they have to generate their own income. So that does put um, huge... Um, problems for them as far as marketing their their show um trying to get you know good people in there for technical support sound lighting all the rest of paying for rights paying for theaters it's a huge burden on them but if you you know committed to your theater this is really what you want to do there's a certain group of people out there producers that will do that um you know sometimes you're going to crash and burn with it and i think you know a lot a lot of people can relate to that there is, in the, on the community level here in Australia, there are some very large theatres because they work on uh, a combination of a volunteer basis, um, paid, some paid staff, and then a lot of professionals who donate their time. They can generate a, a higher revenue, which they then pour back into their community, their um, productions and often you know pouring a lot more money into productions than small independent professional companies so but then there, there they exist for a different reason they exist to give emerging artists a place to perform and in Brisbane you find that a lot with community theatre in that it's a combination of professionals and um, amateur performers because there is amateur uh, professional performers have to stay active and if there's nothing else going at the time and you've got a big company that's doing Chicago or whatever and working with great people, then that's what you go and do. Um, yeah, because you had mentioned you know, that, yeah, because you had mentioned that it's like four or five auditions maybe a month. And so is there a lot of traveling? I, I assume, do you find that people stay localized and just kind of make it work and have jo other jobs on the side? How do they balance all that? Both. <laughs> There's a lot of jobs on the side, isn't there, for all of us. Right. Um, but you know, you've got, I mean, technology has changed a lot too. So you've got your video auditions. Uh, I think Australia sort of, maybe that's a bigger thing in that um, you know, we are so spread out. It's a, we all live on the coast. <laughs> Majority of us live on the coastlines. And, you know, the Gold Coast is an hour from Brisbane. Uh, Melbourne, you know, it's the, it's the bottom end of Australia. It's, it, it, there's no day trips, you know, <laughs> it's sort of pack a lunch and go for a long drive. Um, but no, it's, it's you, a lot of people will make the decision to move south, which is sad for us in Brisbane, which is an emerging creative, you know, hub. But if they feel that that's what they need to do is to be down there where the auditions are, then that's fine. But up here, as I said before, they're generating um, their own work. And there are organisations like Elephant Boot Productions here in Brisbane that support uh, um, these artists that want to, that write their original works and want to get it from the page to the stage, but that's a whole business side of things. How do you do that? So there's organisations like that that help the artist to develop the work and then produce seed funding, all that sort of thing. And they're not alone. Those organisations sprout up through necessity. But you've yeah, got your average actually, day job, you know. Yeah, that was actually what I was going to ask about with because you had mentioned new works. And so I'm glad to see that there are organizations out there that are specifically geared toward that because that's that's so important. I, I, obviously, New York City being the huge uh, mecca for theater in the U.S. that it is, there's a lot of opportunities for you know small writers to national writers to kind of work on their new works, you know, first draft, second draft, and so on. And what is the process there in Brisbane that helps these artists uh, continue to write? Well, we have in Australia, we've got various um, organisations or hubs that support the writer. There's not enough of them. Uh, and of course, seed funding comes from philanthropy. It's, it's not government. So um, you've got the odd organisation here in Brisbane that will support um, emerging artists, but they'll focus on uh, teens and, you know, uh, school age. Um, which is more about funding from government than anything, which it's great, but, you know, your, your artists that have uh, been through school or, you know, come out of college and, and realise, well, I've got my theatre degree, now what do I do? And we churn out a lot of them. And here in Australia, you sort of go, well, where are these people going to get work? And they are not taught the business side of 
being a performer in that, you know, you have to be proactive, you have to get out there, you have to get representation, you have to do all these things. There's not enough taught there. It's all about their skills, which is great, but it's not enough. And so you've got these pockets of philanthropists that are, you know, artists themselves or have been there and, you know, want to support, but you can only support so many people at a time um, when it's hands-on. So we need more of it, but it's definitely there and growing. Brisbane is relatively new. I mean, it wasn't until the 80s when um, uh, it started to develop a musical theatre world because that's when we got our big performing arts complex here in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. So before that, we're out in the sticks, you know. Being that isolation does mean that we develop our own identity as artists, performers, writers, because you haven't generally got the instant influence by a country just across the channel or... Mm anything like that it's we there is a particular australian identity which i which is great which is great what would you say is the difference between those that are writing and from australia about australia as opposed to these maybe international tours or other shows that come in i think australians as a as a people are very laid back and relaxed particularly up here in brisbane almost to the point of fault it's sort of like you know <laughs> need a boot sometimes um but i think uh, you know as you emerge and find an ident identity it is um it, it is more relaxed and i think sort of that that name my name of the blog too an idiot on stage is reflective of that in that australians do tend to be able to laugh at themselves as well so humor is different um but that laid backness that that relaxed uh, personality element can sometimes work against you too in that we do need those drivers to walk alongside us that says okay well you know not that we're all at the beach I'm stereotyping here but you know enough with the surfboard let's get back to riding. well um, with most of the population living there near the coast near, near the beach I, I've, I've traveled there through Sydney and Port Douglas and the Great Barrier Reef and yeah it's so easy to just walk outside and be enamored with the beauty around you I I, I imagine it it can get a little tough to okay all right now I got to get back inside and get back to work and and keep going I know and you don't have cold winters in here in Brisbane, we don't have, you know, snow to, to, to hunker up down in with inside and just stay riding. It's, it's you know, practically 80% of the time it's like your spring. So it's, it's a bit tough. But, um, but no, it's, it's, it's having those organisations like Elephant Boots and, and, and those sorts of things to, to help you to drive along um, that, that work ethic, really. They're, you know, these... We've got some great writers, great performers who work so hard and, and wonderful people. I love them. I love them. But, um, yeah, it's, it's having those people to walk beside you and keep you going in those times. But that's the same for everybody, really, mm -hmm. isn't it? You know, we have our moments right. when it just is too tough. I'm wondering... Life as, happens. Uh, life does happen. That is true. I'm wondering, as, as you say that, if there are any either performers or individuals or theaters that you have worked with that didn't end up making it, that essentially fell by the wayside and, and weren't able to, to maintain and sustain that business side? I think um, on a community level that happens, even though there's a lot of money involved, I think that happens a little bit, not as much as it used to, I don't think. Um, but it, it'll happen two ways. You'll have on a community level where there's a lot of money and not enough business training. And that is across the board for creatives, not enough business training on the, the, the business of theatre. But then you've got all the independence. Every, you know, it's, it sometimes feels like graduation time from theatre school, you get, you know, 200 kids out and then three months later, you've got 200 small theatres have started up, you know. <laughs> it sort of feels like this. And then six months later, you haven't heard from 50 of them, 100 of them have sort of, you know, produced one show and they realised how hard it was. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing. It's a sad thing, but it's not bad. I mean, this is a tough business to be in, no matter what level you're at. And if you don't figure it out, then maybe it's not for you. You know, it's it, you've got to have that drive. You've got to have that that part of you that says, no matter what, I'm going to figure this out. They're your producers. 
they're your people that are going to make theatre happen for people. So it's not bad, but um, without naming names, there has been, you know, major crashes and burns occasionally over the years. And they're really, really sad because they didn't have to happen. Um, and affect a lot of people because they produce great theatre, but because they don't understand the business side. And sometimes it's a case of don't know what they don't know. Mm. Um, they make decisions that it's too late when you realise it was the wrong decision and you can't scrabble back, you can't recoup, that's it, you're out. What would you say are those uh those business techniques, that, that knowledge of business that, that both organizations as well as I think us as individual artists are missing sometimes? Promotion is a major element. Um, promotion is major in that, and I think social media is, a, is fantastic, but it's made us lazy mm. um, in that we think, you know, a little bit of posting to my social media and that's it, everyone knows about me or my show. Um, so there is this understanding or not, the, not enough of an understanding that we have to study this, we have to learn, we have to upskill not just our dance classes, acting classes, voice classes, that's not enough. We also have to take some, and there's plenty online training, there's no excuse for it, but we have to take training um, in, in how to run our social accounts that actually is, are effective rather than us chasing vanity metrics of, you know, how many people liked my post today. Totally pointless. It's, um, it's upskilling on that and understanding as an individual artist that as an individual, we are a business. We, I am a business. I am a business that is promoting my own personal brand. And so how do I do that? That's, you know, you've got to figure that one out. For organisations um, here in Australia, when you've got, say, community organisations that are run by volunteers, now in those volunteer groups, you can be lucky enough to get a professional marketer uh, on team, you can get a professional manager on team, you can get a professional uh, production manager on team, you can be very lucky, majority of them won't. Uh, and it's still the same sense that I get from them in that they don't upskill, they don't know what they don't know, so they're just going to, we just want to get together to create art, we just want to come together to, to create a piece of theatre and I think, well, just, that's great, that's really honourable, but do it in your living room for mum and dad, don't, you know, pour hundreds of thousands of dollars into a show mm. that you can't sell because you don't know the business side. It frustrates the hell out of me, you can probably tell, but it's unnecessary, it's not, it doesn't have to be that way, there's, you know, people, it's always going to be hard work. Mm -hmm. always going to be hard work but um you know you've got to you've got to seek out those other skills management all of that there are people who will help you just put your hand up and ask but i find artists really struggle with that they struggle creative struggle to ask for help yeah i definitely find that in my own life where you know whether, whether it's a personal problem or whether it's you know something that i'm trying to work on the business side as you said i kind of yeah. you know go online and look it up myself or i like try to uh, okay well let's try this or try that I, i'm a lot of times it is that just uh you know throwing something at the dartboard approach and we'll see what hits the bullseye and that's that's, I guess it's good that I keep trying, but when my efforts are going in the wrong direction, then it doesn't help anybody. That mentality of trying new things all the time is the foundation of success. So that, you know, as you say, I try this, it doesn't work, try something else. If you don't have that, then don't bother. That's fantastic. But as you say, when you realize, well, I'm just spitting at a wall here, right. um, finding, and then, and there's plenty of, online world I mean it's different it's different to what it was in the 80s when I was you know starting out um, there was no internet in the 80s and it was a whole different yep. world even researching for an audition was so totally different and uh, I made some really bad mistakes because of that but um, now you know the, the world is your oyster you just have to pick up your phone <laughs> yeah something that you said really struck me is that social media has made us lazy because there mm. there is this instant immediacy of, well, I can just pop on my phone five seconds later, I have the information that I need or, you know, whatever, whatever the audition. And I think that does make us a little lazy and can affect that drive in detrimental ways. Yeah, we, we have to understand that skilling up, we have to put the same effort that we put into our creative skilling into the other areas of our life, whether it be, uh, 
personal development, whether it be the business side of things, it's something that has to be learned. It's not something that, you know, you're going to have instantly just by Googling it. It's something that's going to take time, just as much time as it took you to, you know, learn to tap dance or whatever. It's a constant thing. Mm. So you just add it to your bag of tricks, put it in your rehearsal bag and, and continue to, to improve on it. But um, we tend to attack it as we need it rather than being one of our talents, mm. treating it as one of our talents. And that doesn't work, especially with marketing. And it's part of being a whole person, like we were saying before, of having other experiences, having other interests and hobbies and being a whole person, but also being a whole artist and not just a great singer, a great actor, but someone who knows how to promote it, get it out there and and actually have people who will see it and be interested in it and how it can be used to benefit a theater and all the different ways. So I, I, th I think that that's, that's a great way to look at it because as much as we are individuals and, you know, th there's a lot of ego that goes along with being an <laughs> artist, certainly, and which is wonderful because we have to have the confidence to be on a stage, but it really is a team effort. And I think that that can sometimes get lost because we're so hyper-focused on our individual audition, our individual performance. That's right. I think uh, for me, when I'm casting a show, one of, um, it, one of the biggest things uh, for me is team in that I can have a, you know, a hundred people in a, in a dance call and they can all be fantastic dancers, but I'm going to always be drawn to the one that technically may not be up to scratch to this one over here who's just come off a tour, but she's giving it everything. And she's also got a personality that she's watching out for those around her. That's the one I'm drawn to because I know that when I put 38 people on a stage, I'm not going to have Queen Diva who's going to, you know, be a pain in the royal behind when we get backstage. So I want, I'm building people, I'm building team as much as a show. For me, that, that's my value for me personally in that I couldn't be bothered doing this really if I'm working um, purely for the money because there's not enough of it to begin with. <laughs> but it's for me, it's about people and that's a personal value of mine. I, I, I love to watch the team grow together. I love to stand on the outside, do what my job is, but facilitating them developing the relationships because ultimately once you hit basically dress rehearsal opening night my job's done as a director no one cares who I am it's <laughs> they're the ones that take it forward they're the ones that have to do it each night they're the ones that you know have to take the blows you know they're the ones that have to do it they're, they're, the, they're the stars and uh, that sounds ridiculously humble and stupid doesn't it but it, it is once my <laughs> once opening night hits I can walk away you know MD's busy but I'm, I'm walking away um, and and just watch and enjoy. But, yeah, so it's about team. It's about people. And that comes from if you're walking into an audition space, it's, it's having that confidence to let go of the need to control the outcome. You have mm. no control over the outcome. All you have control over is your skill base and you are there to offer that and don't precast yourself. A number of people who come into my audition spaces with this aura about them that says, very obviously, okay, you've just come from a bad audition and you're bringing it into this one and basically telling me by your stance, I'm not going to get this. It's, mm. you know, you're not going to pick me. Well, well, you just, you know, made sure of that. Right, you just sealed that um, fate, yeah. Just sealed that fate, which is sad because I've been in a situation where I've had a, a young woman come in who did exactly that, but I knew her skills and I had to spend... Uh, I willingly took a bit of time to try and scrape away the, the rubbish that she was covering herself with to determine, am I willing to spend time? Most casting people won't do that. They don't have the time. Right. Um, so if you take the last audition into the next space, you sort of, you know, sealing your fate, as you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's just so hard not to carry those, those disappointments, the rejections and, and whether we've been rejected or whether we know ourselves, we just sucked and bit the dust on that audition. And we kind of carry that energy, as you said, into the room. It's, it's, it's tough to let those things go. It is. And I think this is where I come back to, I've been thinking about this a lot lately is the foundations for an actor. And that is 
knowing before you begin how you're going to react. In other words, you're setting yourself up. This is what I believe. Um, you're setting up your values. This is what I believe about me. This is what this is what I believe is valuable for me when I do get that rejection. And therefore, I'm allowed to be. I'm allowed to feel like crap for a while, but then I will focus on and move to this. How will I do this? I will have these people around me that will allow me to purge and then tell me, move on. You've got to have a plan and not just a plan of how to audition, how to sing, dance, do all of that. You've got to have the plan as a person because these times are going to come. And I see this over and over. There's not enough of the development of the person going in, acknowledging that life happens, these things happen, and they always constantly get surprised, you know, surprised by how they react to a rejection. Why? You've had it before. How many times? Why have you not figured this out yet? You know, you've got to develop a plan. It doesn't make it feel easier. It's still like a kick in the gut. It really is. But if you approach it proactively rather than reactively, I believe, I found this personally, it's you have a stronger stance. You, you, you get out of the doldrums much faster and um, you have more control. You feel like you have more control. You, you still feel the pain, but not as long. And you're the one controlling it, you know? Yeah, I think that sense of control, that's a, a theme that has hit upon several episodes that I've done over the past year and a half, is that, that we, we want to know that we're doing something that is going to create this, we're, we're, that we have some control over what we do in the room, that yes, ultimately casting directors and producers and whatnot, they, they decide that fate of whether we work or not, but there's other things, there's other areas that we can control. And I think by focusing on those and really honing those skills, that's when we can not get as down when, when other stuff out of our control isn't hitting the mark. That's right. And I think this touches on the element of joy in why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. I think we get so busy on the how and the what that we can suddenly like wake up from a sleep and realize that we've forgotten why we were doing this. And we've lost that joy because we're so busy and we honor the busyness. It's like we wear it as a badge on our shoulder. I'm so busy. I'm doing so many auditions. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so busy. And we wear that and, and we shouldn't be, we, we shouldn't be honoring that. It's good to be busy. It's good to be doing that. But when all of the rest of life is going by the wayside, because we're basically saying, I know what's going to happen tomorrow. And we don't, we don't know. And, and this can sort of sounds a bit down, but that what I'm saying is that if we're not living today and without getting woo woo about it, it's, it's, remembering constantly why you did this in the first place, why you enjoy doing it. And I think that's got to be an active thing because it's so easy with the world around us and constant auditions and, and comparison on social media and all the other rubbish. It's const there's a constant battle for our thought life. Mm. And we are, have got to stay in control of that and remember gratitude and all these, these buzzwords that we hear with you know they can be cliche but there's so much truth in them as well that if um we, we've got to remember the, the joy of it because there are some funny moments in our theater lives that we should be laughing at ourselves yeah. you know we've done so much that we try to pack it away in a box because well, that doesn't fit my brand you know well yeah. you know that's the sort of thing you got to remember yeah I mean, look at what we do. Auditions are kind of crazy enough as it is. I, I've gone into auditions where I had to take off my clothes, put on a bathing suit and act like I was on a slip and slide. Now, there was no slip and slide <laughs> around, but yet I needed to act like that. I've had to actually... Oh, Mr. Cop. <laughs> I know. I've had to actually wrestle a blow up alligator float no way. in an audition. I, I had to fight. <laughs> I mean, the things that we do in auditions, it, it's, it's, it's comical. And I think we have it to is. look at them as as kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's part of it's part of the fun, I guess, of it, but it's also part of the absurdity of 
we can't really take it too seriously. And because I think no. once, we, once we start to do that, then yeah, as you said, we lose that joy. And then, we do. then it's kind of a, a, a dead end of, well, then why am I doing this? Why? What, uh, I'll never make it. Never, and it can get really down. And I think this is why your podcast um, is valuable in that it's, a, it's approaching from the other side. It's acknowledging that we have these moments. It's acknowledging the real people behind the performers. And what you find is that if I share my moments of disaster, it opens up other performers to go, okay, that's allowed. I'm allowed. It's okay that I had my own moment. It makes me a real person. You know, I can step outside from my brand. <laughs> You know, when it comes to the, the the name of my podcast, Well, I'll Never Make It, I, I do sometimes wonder, well, when I get that Broadway show, finally, after 10 years of trying, 11 years now, uh, you know, well, I have made it, well, I need to change the title of my podcast. <laughs> do you sometimes think, because I mean, certainly your vast experience doesn't sound like you're an idiot. Do you think that you'll get to that point where you're not an idiot on stage anymore? Um, I don't know that I want to. I think I've considered this, but I think it keeps me humble, Patrick. I think <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly a conversation starter, but no, I think it's who I am. I, I've, I've, it, it has become who I am. Um, not an idiot, but I think through my writing in my blog, the biggest com compliment I ever got from someone was when I met them at an audition, they said, you are exactly who I thought you would be. Mm. And to me that I was blown away by that. And I thought, yes, that's what it is. I don't want, to, I want to be that foil, if you like. I want to, I don't want to be that, that person that um, people um, can't relate to. Right. You know, I'm, right. you know, I want to, I want to be that voice of, st you know, things go wrong you know this this is real real life we all do this um and i think this is my joy i think that's where i get the joy from is is finding those those moments that remind me we are real people doing a really weird job <laughs> that the average world sort of word i often say you know we step on stage which the average person would pee their pants doing you know it's it's something that really frightens people and, you know, the average person going to, if you got a stranger off the street into a rehearsal or a, a dress run or, uh, you know, any of those things, they would be flabbergasted. Yeah. There's a word. They would not, that this is just so weird for them, you know. And um, we become insular in our little bubble world of theatre and we forget that what we do is amazing, crazy, weird, wonderful, fantastic absolutely stupid it's just mate it's just fantastic but yeah, i've found know. that um anytime that i feel i don't know stuck in my career or i feel like i'm not doing everything i should be doing i'm kind of down on myself all i have to do is have a conversation with someone outside the business and and they ask questions about me what i do what i've done and they are blown away they are just mesmerized by mm -hmm what I see is kind of, well, it's all right. You know, it's kind of ho-hum. I mean, it's not, it's not those people. Yeah. No, no, they're mesmerized by every little thing that I've done. And it reminds me yeah. that this, this is, it's a weird business, but it's also a fascinating business. And I need to, it is. That's you know, right. I really need to appreciate that more than I, I do sometimes. I think it's about being a creative, not just having a creative career. There's a difference there and how do I articulate that? It's, you're, you're right in that we take it for granted. Everything we do as creatives is creative. I mean, you know, we, we, I mean, how many of us in musical theatre have a song for every event or everything? You know, it's, sort of, it's my kids just go nuts sometimes. Really, mum, there's a song for that? Of course there is, you know, this is musical theatre life. But um, yeah, it's celebrating what we do. And you're right, getting outside of our bub bubble reminds us, oh, this, this is, this is fantastic. I get to do this in all its forms. And it's not just celebrating the goal that we're chasing, which might be the national tour or the Broadway show or whatever we see as success and it's different for all of us. If that's what we're waiting for to call ourselves true working actors or creatives or successful then 
we're up for a whole life of grief because we don't know when or if that will happen. And so it's celebrating all of those moments along the way, whether it be your, you know, the podcast, it's, it's um, helping another actor. It might be going and doing, you know, serving, I don't know, behind the bar of your local theatre company. I don't know what it is. It's all those things that we consider ho-hum. As you say, the, the world outside has a completely different view of it and we need to celebrate it more than they are. This is our life. So Absolutely. it's gratitude. It's celebrating. Well, I can certainly say that you may be half a world away, but we certainly share the same path when it comes to, to this career and our enjoyment of it. I'm, I'm so thrilled and grateful for you for taking the time out and uh, getting up early morning there to, to talk with me on the podcast. It's been so, it's really, I mean, my husband loves, likes to laugh that, you know, I can talk about theatre under wet cement. And it's true, you know, but it's, it's so nice. I've been really excited to talk to you, you know, other side of the world and everything. And, but you just realise how small the world is that no matter where you are in the world as a creative, our Absolutely. journeys are the same, our lives are the same. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Patrick. It's been so much fun. I really enjoyed this. To learn more about Cheryl Lee, you can go to the website, winmepodcast.com. There in the show notes for this episode, you'll see all the, the details and links about stuff that we've talked about today. And also on the website, you can find a way to help support and donate to the podcast. More importantly, uh, if you enjoy listening to these stories and conversations like Cher and I have had, as much as I love being a part of them, well then please share them with those who you think would uh, benefit and enjoy these conversations as well. As always, thank you for joining me and Cher today. Don't miss a single episode by subscribing on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. I'm your host, Patrick Oliver-Jones, reminding you the reasons for not making it may be countless and frustrating, but the reasons to keep going are even more numerous and rewarding. I'll see you next time.